My name is Paul, and welcome to my podcast. Today we will be breaking down the murder of Kitty Genoese, why it happened and how it can be prevented. On March 13, 1964, Catherine Susan, Kitty Genoese, left the bar in her red Fiat where she worked at at approximately 2.30 a.m. While at a traffic light on Hoover Avenue, she was spotted by her soon-to-be murderer, Winston Mosley, who was sitting in his parked car at 3.15 a.m. Genoese parked her car at a lot 30 meters away from the apartment door. Unbeknownst to her, Mosley was following her. Whilst Genoese walked towards the door, Mosley, armed with a hunting knife, approached her and stabbed her twice in the back. Several of Genoese's neighbors recounted hearing her screams as she ran towards the rear entrance of the building, exclaiming, Oh my God, he stabbed me, help me. Mosley retreated after hearing Robert Moser, one of the neighbors, yell, Let that girl alone. While Genoese laid injured at the rear entrance, no longer in the view of her neighbors, Mosley returned 10 minutes later in disguise and then proceeded to rape, rob, and stab her. The attack lasted for 30 minutes. Wounds on Genovese's hands suggest resistance. Neighbor Sophia Farrar found her shortly after. Early calls to the police were unclear and disregarded by dispatch. After Mosley's final attacks, Carl Ross, instead of calling for the police, called two friends for advice. The second friend called another friend, who finally called the police, who arrived on the scene within minutes. An ambulance picked up Genovese at 4.15 a.m. and she succumbed to her wounds en route to the hospital. One might question why there were no more calls for police or no more aid given to Kitty Genovese. This is a good question, one that should be posed to around the 38 neighbors or witnesses who heard Genovese's cries yet had the inability to help or call the police. Thus, this was the birth of the Genovese syndrome, or better known as the bystander effect. In anthropology, there are four main subdivisions, physical anthropology, cultural anthropology, archaeology, and linguistic anthropology. An anthropologist would relate the case of Genovese's murder to the field of cultural anthropology. The field of cultural anthropology studies culture, cultural aspects of language and communication, socialization, social control, class, and much more. So how is culture associated with this murder? Well, in specific places in New York, especially between 1960s and the 1990s, crime was unfortunately a huge part of New York's culture. While data is missing for the year 1964, in the year 1965 alone, there had been 836 murders, 2,320 rapes, and around 28,182 robberies. With numbers like those, it makes sense that thoughts of crimes and violence would be on the minds of citizens constantly. Thus, there would exist a culture of fear among citizens. Those who weren't taking part in crime wouldn't want to be associated with anything crime-related so as to keep from drawing attention to oneself. Others, on the other hand, might be drawn to the life of crime, like Mosley, who on top of being a murderer, was a serial burglar. This crime culture had cultivate, was cultivated especially in the slums of New York, where those who didn't have money decided that the best way to make money from their environment would be to steal and murder. Furthermore, with fear ingrained in the minds of citizens, it would make them sense that it would make sense that no one called the police for Genovese, seeing as no one wanted to be involved and risk bringing harm upon themselves. Those 38 who heard the screams of Genovese were those who had fallen under the fear that came with New York's crime culture. Not to mention that the citizens of New York would most likely have been desensitized to the crime. Similar to anthropology, sociology studies the interaction and conflicts within social groups and determine how society functions. Thus, a sociologist would interpret the murders as a result of a conflict in roles, norms, and values. In the scenario of the murder of Genovese, the citizens would obviously be playing the role of bystander. A responsible bystander would attempt to intervene and call for help. Um, however, for some of these bystanders, there would be a conflict between their roles as a family member and someone important to other people. They were not going to risk their lives for someone they didn't quite know. Another perspective to take on would be that of a forensic sociologist. Forensic sociologists are invited to crime scenes in order to determine negligence. They work crime in criminal and civil cases. After investigating a crime scene, they study the history of violence or crime in the area. So, a forensic sociologist would come to an understanding 
At the magnitude it was at, crimes in New York were inevitable. Citizens would witness crimes in some way or another, somewhat becoming desensitized to the idea of violence as mentioned in anthropology. If they were desensitized to crime and violence, the value one would have towards the victim would fall drastically. In psychology, one of the biggest questions that get asked is why do humans behave as they do? So in the case of Genovese's murder, why did no one call the police earlier? And why did no one help? And what is the bystander effect? While humans are empathetic creatures, humans also be, he seem to be inherently selfish. Humans will always look out for themselves and those close to them, thus explaining why when hearing Genovese's screams, no one opted to take action in order to keep from harm. The murder can be seen through the lens of social psychology. Social psychology is a scientific study of how thoughts, feelings, behaviors of individuals are influenced by the actual imagined or implied presence of others. Further contemplation on social psychology leads to the discovery of the bystander effect. The gist of this social phenomenon is the idea that individuals are less likely to help a victim when more individuals are also present. At the time of Genovese's attack, most neighbors most likely had the same thought. Someone is bound to help her. But at the back of their heads, a more sinister continuation would have been, but it's not going to be me who helps her. The bystander effect is a culmination of diffusion of responsibility, mutual denial, and ambiguity. Diffusion of responsibility, as stated, occurred since no one wanted to take responsibility and help Genovese, instead placing the responsibility on some inexistent individual who would come to the help of Genovese, Mutual denial and ambiguity both stem from a groupthink mentality. See, when some of the neighbors deemed the situation as not as serious and looked away, others would do the same because they saw them looking away. Recall some of the symptoms of groupthink are mind guards and illusions of unanimity. So why were the people looking away in the first place? Who started looking away? See, there are three things that will determine the degree of responsibility a bystander will feel. If one, if they feel the victim is deserving of their help, two, the competence of the bystander, three, the relationship of the bystander and the victim. Thus, it can be determined, be determined that Genovese, in the eyes of her neighbor, was either not deserving of attention or simply uh, the situation wasn't perceived as serious. The anthropologist's perspective was based on the idea that since crimes in New York have been historically high, crime culture became a big part of the New York identity, which spread fear amongst its citizens, which desensitized them to the idea of crime and violence, which ended up in what happened to Kitty Genovese, where no one came to her help. Even today, crime in New York still exists. In fact, numbers show an increase in the past years. The anthropologist's solution would be to cut down the amount of crime in New York, which is uh, pretty difficult to do, but they could introduce bigger penalties and punishments, do anything that will expose the citizens to less violence and reduce fear. The sociologist's solution uh, would be to do the same thing, honestly, to help citizens become less desensitized to crime. The psychologist's solution would be to combat the bystander effect, which ties it all together. So all three of these solutions are that are tied in together since they address the same problems at different angles. One solution to the bystander effect specifically would be to get to know your neighbors. Get to know the people around you, close enough around you. Make sure that they know who you are, get close, have a trusting relationship. Be in a place where they will be inclined to help you in situations of dire need. Be a part of your community, you know, give and take. If you're a bystander, take action. There could be others who can help, but be the first help and others will follow behind you. It's the same thing of the group thing. If they, it's sort of the opposite. See, they saw people looking away, so others looked away. If they see people helping, they will come to help. Disregard thoughts of consequences that come with, help, with trying to help a victim. Stay focused on the task at hand, helping the victim or calling for help. And model altruism and acts of kindness to the young. Hold conventions and presentations to nurture the virtue of altruism in the young so that they will, in the future, will be inclined to help. Strengthen witness anonymity so there is no longer fear in calling for help. Social change is the transformations in beliefs, social interactions, practices, organizations, and structures of society. 
So what method of social change can be applied to this scenario? Methods of bringing about social change are divided into three main categories, conventional politics, violence, and nonviolence. So which method is most suitable to dealing with this real life situation? A solution would be, would maybe uh, be to enact policies to strengthen witness anonymity. Other changes that could be made is attempts to make the streets safer for men and women alike. Uh, see, Mosley was specifically targeting women. He thought they were easier to kill. And at the time, crime committed by males on women were the most prevalent in terms of crime ending in victim harm, murder, and rape. By societal norms, women were generally perceived as fragile, by men specifically. One would need to enact a change in order for women to be perceived as stronger, or attempts would be need to made to educate women on becoming able to defend themselves in an attack. However, there would be barriers to this sort of social change. For example, there would be the barrier of attitude and behavior models. Some women may argue that there should be a change to crack down on more harshly on men, and that it is not women that need to change, but men. While this may be true, no matter the punishment, crimes will still continue. We need to make women less fragile, less of a target. Make self-defense programs easily accessible, teach the younger generations of the dangers that exist, empower the everyday citizens to become bystanders that take action.